and make uh, make co-host or oh okay i'll do that yeah just give me that he's a co-host okay. there you okay. go okay great Hello. Hi, Mark. Hello. Hello. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's what what uh, what time? You call. Is it? I answer. Well, it's uh, one o'clock in the afternoon here on, oh, okay. uh, on uh, Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. That's it. Right. You're ahead of us. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we've got two marks, and I'm gonna have to distinguish between Mark with a C and Mark with a K. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so we can get started. We're right at six o'clock. Um, it's great. Lots of people here from all over. It looks like. Oh, minus six in Invermere. It's colder there. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Really happy um, to have Dr. Mark Grant back with us. Um, he was with us a, a year or two ago, and uh, it's time to revisit a, a topic that mm -hmm. uh, pertains to so many people. And um, he is really the person that I go to it, for this uh, in this area. But before we dive into that, I'm just going to pass it to Mark Lawrence to get us started tonight. Right. I would just like to welcome uh, Dr. Mark Grant. Thank you so much for uh, joining us once again um, to talk about chronic pain, trauma, uh, EMDR, and hypnosis, which uh, is Mark is probably one of the foremost experts in the world. And we uh, we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. It was uh, it was very interesting a year and a half, I think it was about a year and a half ago or so that we had you. I think it was in our summer of yeah, like 2021, if I recall. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome back and thank you very much. And then to our patients, um, just you know, use the chat. Uh, it's a safe uh, place to safe space. Um, respect one another's confidentiality, uh, please and um, enjoy tonight's presentation. So without further ado, Thanks. welcome to Madeline and Mark. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. So um, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Mark Grant, who is coming to us from Melbourne, Australia, where it's really warm. And um, so Mark is a clinical psychologist that I have known about since I started uh, EMDR. Oh, gosh, uh, um, that's a, a type of uh, treatment for trauma that I'm, I'm sure Dr. Grant will uh, go into many years ago. Um, but he's been a clinical psychologist for over 20 years and has done a lot of work, a lot of research around the link between stress and trauma and pain, and a lot of research in the area of um, EMDR. And also, I think more recently, maybe not just, you know, in the last couple of years around hypnosis. And uh, mm -hmm. so really excited to dive into tonight's topic. I will keep an eye um, on the chat for questions that come up and I'll either hold them for the end or if it's relevant, if it's okay, Mark, I'll just kind of interrupt you as we go along. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. great. So um, welcome, I'll pass it over to you to get Thank started. you, thank you, Madeline, thank you, Mark. Uh, Thanks for having me and um, looking forward to sharing some of my work and and my knowledge with you and your your patients and hopefully they'll I'm sure there'll be something in what I share that you'll all you know everyone will take away that will help them to cope with their work or their pain a little bit bit better. I um I'd forgotten that I was talking to I guess non-professional audience and I preferred prepared a more professional talk but um i'll tailor it as we go to the audience and um i'm i'm um, a great believer in what albert einstein said that if you can't explain it to a six-year-old you don't understand it so i've i always try and keep my my talks you know uh simple and understandable and practical uh, regardless of of the audience so i'm sure that this isn't going to be a problem 
Um, yeah, these guys are pretty well educated too. I will tell yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think oh, that's. I've got a sophisticated audience. That's good you to know. Sure do. Yeah. Um, now I'm just trying to get my old computer here to go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. There you go. So, um, so I know some. So I know um, you're probably all. I guess I just want to start by saying, you know, why, why, why am I talking about trauma and pain? Uh, first, first off, and um, um, because, of course, they're often associated with each other. Um, a lot of, a, quite a lot of, mo I, I find most chronic, most, most of my chronic pain clients have experienced some sort of trauma, either, and, and we, you know, in terms of an accident or an injury or something like that, not necessarily life threatening, but something bad's happened to them. Sometimes a lot of bad things have happened to them. And, um, you know, they're not alone in that. That's so, you know, we know that PTSD affects about one in 10 people. And a lot, but a lot also along with that, a lot of, uh, folk that have developed pain or health problems will have will have had attachment issues so they wouldn't have had a secure bonding with their parents as a child and that probably more than trauma is one of the main predisposing factors for uh, later health problems in life because uh, basically when a child doesn't feel secure and safe um, they, you know, they're going to be anxious. They're going to have to develop or find strategies for feeling safe that don't really rely on uh, turning to mum or dad. And, and that might be keeping busy or being, a, being the perfect child or, or later in life developing addictive kind of patterns, um, none of which is very good for your health. So that's, that's really why we go on about trauma and also it's it's of all the of all the mental health problems anxiety depression you, you know trauma has the greatest impact of any other life kind of event on physical and mental health excluding of course you know if you've if you've had a serious injury or or medical illness and you know that's uh, perhaps un uncurable uh, but from a psychological point of view um it's the most impactful and of, of course it often is associated with illness and injury and disease so that when you add that together that's quite a package for any human being to have to deal with and the um you know, kind of the connection between trauma and and pain and illness is often not recognized and that's why it's great really that you guys invite me on because you you get it and you're not just looking at it as a purely, uh, you know, mm -hmm. from a purely medical point of view. Absolutely. We, I don't know if you're familiar. We have a, a doctor here in BC, Dr. Gabor Maté. Oh, at, yes. Yeah. Oh. He's like, just, I want to say just down the road, but not just down the road, uh, who just came out with a book, The Myth of Normal. So yeah. for people that are listening, just to know that you are not alone to have some type of trauma in your history. Um, mm. And his his book is really really good. The myth of normal. Yes, I, I I from memory I know he he identifies some characteristics of people who will you know who are more likely to get sick, and one of them is pleasing others. I think mm -hmm. another one is holding your emotions in. Uh, there are five. There are five. I can't remember them all, but. Mm. You know, in terms of what I just said, though, those are characteristics of trauma survivors, right. um, and atta and survivors of attachment disorders because they don't have anyone they they can feel safe to express their feelings with, or, or and um, they, uh, you know, they kind of have to be someone they're not in order to get loved. Exactly. So they end up being people pleasers quite often. Right. 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 And the problem with that is, if you're if you're a people pleaser, you're not uh, um, you're not putting yourself first. You're putting everyone else first, and um, you might be overworking or or just not just uh, just taking too much responsibility on yourself. And that and that and we all do that from time to time. But if you do that habitually, it's just it's just too much demands on the nervous system, and it, and it does it will lead. To illness and disease even if you know if nothing else happens it, it affects your immune system your but you know kind of the kind of the 
you know, the balance between the biochemistry in your body and um, your, your sleep wake cycle, everything. So as, 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 they, as we say, the body keeps the score. And it's, it's a hard truth because the person who's trying to cope with uh, adversity, who's trying to appear strong and okay, and like, you know, whatever trauma or, or emotional neglect they experienced hasn't affected them. Um, for a while, you can do a great job of covering that up and looking like you've got it all under control, nothing to see here. And they are, are often very successful for, for quite a long time and appear to have escaped, you know, the trauma, the abuse, the neglect of their childhood. And it's um, terribly, it can be very uh, disappointing and frustrating when they do get sick and can't cope anymore, you know, to have to come back to and face that reality and deal with it. And it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think, um, yeah. you know, if people can relate to that, that kind of high achieving, you know, um, successful, uh, but as a, as a trauma, as a response to trauma, as a trauma response, uh, partly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, quite, I think quite a few people in our profession are probably, you know, probably, you know, got those characteristics as well. It's not, it's not uncommon at all, mm -hmm. but it's, it's deceptive because, you know, the, um, it, it, um, I guess, unlike a broken leg or, or something, it's not visible and it's hidden from the person who's, who's trying to survive and it's hidden from their treating professionals. And I'm mm -hmm. going to talk a bit about, about that in a minute, but just to so just, just moving on. So, so of course, you know, we know all know about trauma it's, you know, it's, it's accidents, it's rapes, it's natural disasters, it's all those sorts of things. But it's, it's more than it's more than that. Um, it can be uh, workplace bullying, it, you know, it can be workplace bullying. It can be being in hospital for a long time, having multiple surgeries, life threatening diagnoses, just just I had a client recently who was in a ward um, where that people had respiratory problems and and you know was lying there all night listening to people gasping for air, uh, so hosp hospitals can be uh, being a hospital can be traumatic as well and of, of course last but not least just just um, uh, not having adequate love and support in in one's developmental years and that's probably the hardest one to acknowledge and to admit because no one wants to say they didn't have great parents or well, most of us don't and. Um, most of, because of the of their age at which at which a neglect or abuse happens of that kind, and not even talking about sexual abuse, I'm just talking about emotional neglect or abuse. Um, we're not we're not aware of it, and you know we um, we grow up really really perhaps feeling you know um, not knowing what's normal, and and growing up with a with a, a mother with a mental health problem or an alcoholic father or an absent father who's workaholic is not a normal or healthy thing, but it happens a lot. And most children adapt to it, but at, 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 at the expense of their own natural development and e evolution, they have to become someone that they're not in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard to describe, it's easier to describe what happened as opposed to what didn't happen. Um, anyway, that's probably another, but it's hard for a child to, to know what's not there if it's not there. Yeah, exactly. And in actual fact, most of those children, you know, except in the worst cases, they had food on the table, they went to school, and they will tell you that their childhood was great, it was, that it was normal, that there was nothing wrong with it. And on the outside, it, it was, but inside there was this, this, this big vacuum that they had to, had to adjust. So... Uh, and th and that's not that their parents were bad; that they were just a product of their upbringing. And um, oh, actually, I'm I'm treating a Holocaust, so, uh, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor at the moment, and um, her 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 father survived, you know, unbelievable horrors. And in order to do that, he had to be pretty strong and pretty tough. And so when he's bringing her up, and and you know, she's tired or emotional. He he just tells her to be strong and don't cry and 
and um, mm -hmm. don't be don't be weak. And she so she's learned not to you know that you know basically that her physical needs that don't, don't matter and that her you know being vulnerable is bad. And you know uh, he you know she doesn't in a way she doesn't know she knows intellectually that the Holocaust is over, but somatically she's still living you know her father's life in a way and um, it's caused um you know tremendous health problems for her she's 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 had uh, had some had some injuries and then they've been exacerbated just by the levels you know she's living really in a state of constant alert um because it just because of that conditioning so intergenerational trauma uh, is, is is what they call it and it's it's not uncommon uh, the children are living out the parents trauma so so post traumatic stress disorder or uh, is is the some of the most simple form of trauma that we can talk about and it's really really a, um, a condition that involves a lot of physical as well as mental and emotional symptoms including nightmares or flashbacks which can actually include um you know the pain of say say sexual abuse trauma or or a motor vehicle accident uh, there's often there's often increased arousal so the 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 person is never really relaxed and and um this is this can be sort of subtle to pick up on a lot of us who have learned to cope quite well are are very good at really looking um you know so as though we're you know, there's nothing. No, not we're not tense. We get very, human beings get very good at hiding their feelings. I mean, I'm a little bit tense now, having to to explain this material to. I probably don't look or sound very tense, but I can assure you, I'm my. You know, I'm a little bit probably more aroused than I would normally be. But probably a lot of you would have no idea of that. So, so it's it's sort of subtle to to be aware of, but really. Uh, it's it means that you you never re you know when a person's aroused all the time it, their mind is always going they're never really relaxed they're always thinking of the next thing they're often not really engaged in the present moment and they're always sort of always sort of thinking what what's coming next so uh, trauma survivors while they're while on the outside they're functioning quite normally their their lived reality is very different and 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 their their sense of connection and ability to be present and experience joy in the moment is um, it's 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 off, it's missing. Um, that's probably the best way I can describe it. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of spontaneity. It's not safe to be spontaneous. Mm. Yeah, Karen says hypervigilance. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like kind yeah. of always that to always on edge. Always on, always on. Always on. Uh -huh. Okay. And when you've done that all your life, it just feels normal. You don't, you don't, you don't have any other experience. You don't know that, that there's any other different way of living. Um. And so, and some, and some of the other other things, are, of course, with, with trauma, with, there's an avoidance of places or people that might trigger uh, trauma memories, and that can that can be that can sort of extend to all kinds of things. So, um, you know, we can understand that in a perhaps in a sexual abuse victim avoiding sexual encounters or something, or a motor vehicle accident survivor avoiding freeways but it extends to a lot to and and survivors of uh emotional neglect in childhood they're almost afraid of everything anything mm -hmm. new anything novel anything challenging they're <clears> often <throat> afraid of relationships and and trusting people uh, the world's not a safe place uh, they like they really like a routine and predictability and just the same old uh, they don't like novelty uh, or anything that challenges their sense of efficacy and safety. In some cases, that can be, you know, there can be a sort of a seeking for danger and thrills, but that's more of a traumatic response rather than, you know, their true self. Mm -hmm. And and the, the sense of self is often damaged. There's often they just feel flawed and, you know, um, so, somehow how defective uh, without really knowing why. Since shame, a lot of shame. 
So just so just to make the, just to be able to point out, so there's, there's there's two types of PTSD, and and the simple the simple sort of PTSD that's caused by a single event, uh, you don't see that much in people with chronic health problems. It's much more the complex PTSD, which is caused by more long term sort of circumstances, typically starting in childhood. They've often experienced um, oppression of some kind. Maybe racism, maybe just a low socioeconomic status, but but um, they, they don't usually come from very well-to-do families, uh, and there although there are other types of trauma in those families as well, and they're usually and it's, it's much more severe than normal PTSD. And really, what they look like is, as I've been talking about, is, is they have difficulty regulating their emotions. So they've got to look, they've got to do something in order to feel calm. And they, and they certainly don't turn to other people in order to do that. Uh, generally, they are there's that dissociation I was talking about, and it's not just an avoidance of novel or challenging situations, but their personality uh, tends to be sort of split in a way into parts. So there's a part, there's the part that keeps you know, keeps working, keeps everybody happy, uh, you know, appears normal. And there's often a hidden kind of part that carries their feelings, their vulnerability, their fears, their needs, uh, which doesn't really get shared with anyone, including themselves. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, I guess, trauma survivors and chronic pain sufferers are kind of split off from themselves. Not all, but I'd say the vast majority. Um, when they've got this sort of coping strong part out front and their wounded vulnerable part, uh, you know, tucked in behind. And um, often, you know, often the really the most important thing you know, I do in my work is helping them to admit that they have a, a vulnerable kind of younger part that lives within themselves and connecting with that part and, um, acknowledging it and and giving it what it needs, and which kind of facilitates you know, more of a sense of integration in the person. So, um, the, you know, their 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 personality is is uh, structurally um, it's called a compartmentalized. Um, again, there's the damaged sense of self. Uh, Hard, really hard to form deep trusting relationships, and uh, just different. You know, life life just has, life is really about an ep life for them is like an episode of Survivor. You know that TV show. It's not it's not much about fun and joy and and, and loving and laughter. It's just just a struggle. I just have a question here, yeah. Mark. It might be a good time. Um, yeah, sure. How um, flashbacks are connected with past trauma. Yeah, so so flashbacks, which can, as I said, can be physical or mental, can be um, a, a you know kind of relive it, you know, kind of they can bring the the past trauma uh, forward into the present. So the you know the uh, victim of sexual abuse might actually might actually re-experience physically, you know, the experience of being abused when they're having a flashback. So the part you know the past is in the present. Much more common it takes the form of when when a trauma survivor is faced with a situation where they feel unsure about their ability to control them, you know what's happening or be safe, they will have increased arousal and they'll lose the ability to kind of concentrate and make good decisions in the present moment. And um, it's not a flashback per se, but in, in a way it is a kind of bodily, Re, you know, reliving or re-enactment of those earlier experiences of feeling unsafe and threatened. Mm -hmm. Right. So not necessarily a flashback, but that feeling of confusion or uncertainty, or kind of not of of yeah, uh, 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 not feeling safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um. um there was another. Sorry. Uh, I'll say this question now because I think it'll probably come up at, at, at either now or later, but it's a great question about the trauma just from being in constant pain. Um, yeah, you know, the uncertainty that's a trauma. in itself and just wondering if you if you treat it the same way. But I, I suppose we'll get into treatment. For those questions about treatment, we'll probably get into that late, uh, uh, in a bit. <laughs> No, actually, that, I, I'll, I'll take that now because, and, that, and I 
that's a good point. Pain is a kind of trauma. Being not being able to be comfortable in your body, and not knowing how that's not long that's going to last. Um, not maybe not having effective ways of coping with that. That's that's stressful. I mean, it, apart from anything else that might have happened in your life, that, you know, if you're if you have chronic pain, it's it's terrible it, and it's scary and um, it's traumatic. It, it really it's really traumatic. That's the only word for it. And I think that that's something that needs to be. I'm glad that question came up. I think that's something that needs to be uh, highlighted and acknowledged much more mm. um, mm-hmm. uh, than it is. You know, pain suffers. You know, they people switch off. They don't want to hear. They're not interested. And um, it's very hard to find people that you can, I think, express that that to. Um, mm-hmm. Very it's, isolating. It's, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, even with all the best, you know, with EMDR, hypnosis, good, you know, medication, whatever you're doing, even with all the best treatment in the world, um, you know, you can have pain flare-ups, you can have relapses. And it's, you know, it's scary and it's stressful. And um, I think uh, it's something that, that people need to be able to acknowledge, that, really acknowledge their feelings of fear and anxiety about that. I teach, I teach my clients that um, the flare-ups and setbacks are kind of part and parcel of the journey and um, that it's the journey rather than a destination healing and that that you have a that they have a plan for what to do when they when they have a plane flare up or a setback so I have I have um, actually I was just treating a lady yesterday who happens to be a psychologist and she um, for a long time, it was just like everyone else in complete denial about her uh, her condition and um, someone who likes to keep her emotions very tamped down. And so she developed a system now where she takes she takes the emotion out of it and she rates the pain flare up on a scale of naught to ten. And if it's uh, where where uh, ten is the worst and naught is you know nothing, not not very serious, and anything up to five she she just keeps going but if it's above five in terms of its intensity she has a whole bunch of self-care strategies that she puts into place like you know um you know cancelling her clients for the rest of the day going home and doing some meditation or having a hot soak and she's um you know she just she just does that automatically once she's decided what level of flare-up it is and i think that that helps having a plan Mm-hmm. in place and some strategies that you don't have to sort of think about that you've just got there ready to go that you're ready to go with right that's an excellent point yeah yeah so you know that that's a, a bit of security in itself that i'm going to check in with myself and after this point this is what exactly what i do mm-hmm. it's hard yeah. to remember when your pain is high sometimes exactly exactly that's why you have. So she's got it. She's. I don't know if she's got it on a bit of paper somewhere, or if she's just got it in her head now. But she's got uh, a plan, and she's. Except most importantly, she doesn't try and kid herself that that you know she can just push her way through it. That, that she's got a rating system to know how severe the setback is, and you know what action she needs to take. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, so and. Um, just quick, just a quick point. So, so stress, trauma, is um, it's associated with a lot of sort of conditions that people will come in with that are not completely medically explicable. And this is just a, a quick list. The point, the point here to make is that um, these diseases of stress can affect all bodily systems. You know, the stomach, the the heart and lungs, the skin, uh, the you know. Um, the muscular, you know, the mus, the muscle, muscles and and bones, and that these conditions are they really occur in isolation. So if you have fibromyalgia, for example, you're probably also suffering from headaches, fatigue, irritable bowel syndromes, and so on. Mm-hmm. If you suffer from hypertension, you've probably also got obesity and diabetes. You know, they're commonly correlated. So you never, you very rarely just get one on its own. And it doesn't, and just because you have a disease of stress doesn't mean you don't also have a medically diagnosable illness or injury as well. So it it gets real overlapping between organic and uh, sort of systemic 
uh, stress-related conditions. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, how often you see sort of these clusters of conditions together, Mark? It's yeah, it's so interesting, you know. Well, and it's, I think as a, as a physician, as soon as you see those clusters, you can pretty well guarantee that there is trauma. Uh, there's been mm -hmm. trauma of some kind, mm -hmm. uh, even if the client's not not aware of it. Again, mm -hmm. you know, be, be not many times when there isn't. And um, this is just a quick cartoon just to show how people, how it's natural to to hide it. It's a coping mechanism. People, people just naturally don't want to show their vulnerability. And that's a survival mechanism. It's not good to be vulnerable in the wild. It's unsafe. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something that our society really uh, supports, you know, at, uh, at, the, at, a, at a work meeting or something, if you're having a bad day, you know, it doesn't really support like uh, crying at, you know, or expressing your emotions. And, and even sometimes on the joyful end of the scale, you know, it's not always safe to have that um, full spectrum of uh, emotion. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, a lot of trauma, uh, Andrew Leeds, an EMDR trainer, is develop, uses the term affect phobia. So they're not only scared of showing their vulnerability, they're scared of appearing happy. They're scared of showing anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just don't don't show don't show yourself and you'll be okay. So again, I was, um, I'm not going to go into this one too much, but this is just uh, this is just a schema of the role of dissociation in um, uh, traumatized chronic pain sufferers. And and um, again, I'd sort of prepared this for a professional audience. So I'm not going to go into all that too much. Uh, we've talked about it a fair bit already. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I won't, I don't think there's any need to go into that too much here. Yeah, there's so many great comments. I just want to say that, you know, oh. this is really kind of hitting home with a lot of people. And um, there are a couple questions about CPTS, a complex uh, PTSD, yeah. um, you know, it, it and around treatment and is it possible to, to heal or, um, Think that was the question or is it kind of a lifelong condition uh yeah uh that's that's a great question it um it's part i mean healing doesn't mean you don't have scar tissue mm -hmm. so so it, it's it, um you know you 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 can you can overcome the effects of cptsd and emotional neglect mm -hmm. to a large degree and i see that and if I have a chance, uh, I've got so many videos of that. But I, I have people who who become pain free, who've who've had, you know, like who um, who've had pain for a long time and have had a lot of bad things happen to them. The que the, the question, the real answer, and that's that's a good question. Is it really depends on the individual and just how damaged they are and how much how how severe the health problems are. And for so that the degree of healing that's possible really depends on how much energy the person has or able to access, mm -hmm. and how you know how many coping skills they can develop, and, and so we're all we're all different, and some people um, seem to survive incredible adversity with very relatively unscathed, and other people who, you know it really knocks them sideways. So so it just really depends on the person's underlying personality and health. But there is, well, there's always scope for improvement and for healing, no matter who you are. And I think the most important thing is to have hope, and to have to have a good therapist, you know, who you trust and feel safe with. And and then I think um, anything's possible. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think it was Plato that said he he or she who has hope or faith is twice armed. And and hope is a hard it's a hard thing for people with chronic pain and complex trauma because they've often been knocked down so many times they've been to so many specialists and had so many failed treatments and or so many setbacks that they start to lose hope and um, it's it's important to keep hope and to to know that no matter how many times you get knocked down you can if you get up again and keep going with the support of your therapist and the help of your friends 
you know, healing is still possible. And, um, you know, it's, um, you can never underestimate the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that, that hope and belief and faith are, are probably is what defines the people who do the best in treatment than those that don't. If you lose hope and can't find it, you know, you're, you're, it's not good. It's not good. Mm -mm. All right. So, so Ian Diaz is the treatment that I've been using for a long time with chronic pain. And really what Ian Diaz is, is, is about is about helping people to process the traumatic memories that are maintaining their pain. Um, so that could be sexual abuse. It could be uh, a motor vehicle accident. Uh, but it really, any, any unprocessed past trauma that has been carried forward in the body and EMDR really um, does that. It's, it's not a talk therapy, uh, but it's uh, really a desensitization process, which involves um, getting the person to recall uh, their, their traumatic memory. So that could be just, it could be a parent just constantly criticizing them. And then while they're, while they're holding that memory in their mind, Watching, uh, watching or listening to bilateral stimulation uh, in the form of eye movements, and then the, you know they do that for however long it takes, and then afterwards, what tends to happen is the bilateral stimulation stimulates a relaxation response, and um, that that relaxation response becomes paired with the memory. Essentially, what EMDR does is it hijacks. There's many ways of explaining but it hijacks the fight flight response so if you think if i ask you to think of the traumatic memory and you you will feel upset as you think about that and then i stimulate and your your, your fight flight response is activated and then i stimulate bilateral stimulation either with tones or eye movements or even tapping your brain is going what is that it has to deal with the bilateral stimulation and in a sense you're, 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 we're hijacking your fight flight response because it's got to deal with the bilateral stimulation, you know, and which is happening in the present. Even though intellectually you know that that is just my finger going backwards and forwards, your subcortical brain is, is, is going, there's something moving out there. What is it? And is it a friend or is it a foe? And so it forgets about the traumatic memory and it's focusing on the bilateral stimulation. Once it's, dis once it's ascertained that it's not a threat, which happens after about 30 seconds, you go into a relaxation response. And all this happens without you having to think or talk or do any meditation or do anything. It's purely automatic. And that's the beauty of EMDR. It's actually harnessing the fight-flight response to help you to feel better. And it's, 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 it's so much easier than, a, than say, I guess, approaches that re rely on positive thinking or even meditation because those approaches are a lot of work and it's a very mm -hmm. slow kind of way to do it so for those for those folk whose pain has mainly been maintained by trauma particularly simple trauma EMDR affords a very fast and efficient route to healing it's very good for clients with say uh um you know, whiplash from motor vehicle accidents, as long as it's within the recent past. If it's whiplash that happened a year ago and it's a grave, you know, it's a more severe form of whiplash, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, for uh, I've seen it work with victims of child sexual abuse who have had vaginismus or, or gastrointestinal problems. They got triggered by stress in the present. And when you dealt with a the trauma, their symptoms resolved. But, but again, so, it depends on their basic health and well-being. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, simple trauma, meaning one one major incident of trauma that Correct. you're working on, Correct. rather than multiple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, just to be clear, Mark, the bilateral stimulation means stimulating one side of the brain, the other side, one side, the other side. So yeah, either tones. We have a, a meditation that we uh uh. uh an audio file that we give out with one of our classes that has bilateral um, tones. So oh, that yeah. would be okay. the, a, a, a similar thing, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah. And whether you can do that for pain, you can do that for anxiety, you can, you, you know, that, that bilateral stem, it really, this really gives them something else to focus on that is soothing. And the, the different, the difference is that, you know, we can, you can, the difference is that the reason I like bilateral is that it's different to music. The brain does not process, the brain processes bilateral stimulation differently to music. So if you play a very relaxing piece of music, like Beethoven's Ninth, the trouble is that your brain knows it's Beethoven's Ninth. And it's very easy for your brain to sort of switch off and go back to worrying or thinking about the pain. It's mm. just not captivating enough. Only, right. only bilateral stimulation holds your attention in that, in that really powerful way that enables the change to happen. That's why it works unlike those other kinds of sensory stimulus. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. and you can't I, ignore it. You can't ignore it when it's uh, stimulating one side. Then Very side hard to ignore. And when, you, when you've when you got pain, you need something that is going to kind of, it's going to grab you more than that, as, as it were. It's, it's like the old, if you've stubbed your, stubbed your thumb or hit the other one with a hammer, it's the same sort of thing. You need a, a stimulus that will overpower the pain. And there are not many stimuli that will do that. Yeah, no. Um, and so, and it doesn't just have to be eyes. For example, if, um, I don't know what a nystagmus is, Karen, but I'm guessing it's something to oh, do with eyes. Oh, an eye condition. It's an, an eye condition, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then you would use the either um, the beats, binaural beats, or uh, pulse pulsating in your hands, right? The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Vibration. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I also started doing EMDR for trauma a, quite a number of years ago, and I found it, um, yeah, very, very can can be very powerful, mm. um, very effective. And, and so with, um, I know we've got to get on to hypnosis, but that's okay. <laughs> with COVID, I did notice a lot of um, psychologists uh, and therapists providing EMDR online. Do yes. You, do you yes. provide? On, do you do it online as well? I have not seen a client, a patient in person in two years. Oh, okay. So yeah. So I'm so, all yes. on. I'm all online now. Okay. Especially, I have people all over the world anyway. So. Right. But yes, I, I've gone all online now. Right. So it is available online. Yeah. And I think yeah. you would just, um, yeah, you would just yeah. uh, Google it and find someone. Yeah. I've got so to this, say that's, so this, that's, that's yeah. the best explanation of EMDR and how it works. That. Thank you. I mean, just that was really good. That was brilliant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, as I said, if you can't explain to a six year old, you don't understand it. And they make it so complicated with the eight stages and REM mm -hmm. sleep and this oh and my that. Goodness, yes. You know, it's just, sorry, mm -hmm. it's just, we, I think we, or we therapists tend to just over engineer things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so thank you for that. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, Mark, a question, because I know you deal specifically with, and you actually have a protocol for dealing, uh, treating pain with EMDR. Um, if you're not focused on, I think the question was uh, just the one, like, say, traumatic event, can you also use it just for daily pain? Absolutely, yes. Uh, good, good question. No, you don't have to be. You don't have to be processing a, t a past event. You can you can target the present pain. Okay. And okay. that can work very well, especially for chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it produces that relaxation response and, and, and either, and it'll either reduce the pain or it'll just make, sometimes it doesn't change the level of the pain, the actual subjective level of nociception, but the client, the patient will say, you know, it just feels further away. It doesn't feel, it doesn't seem to be bothering me as much anymore. So it kind of, it just kind of sort of, sort of compartmentalizes it. Got it. Yeah. The exception is if the patient has some uh, some serious diagnostic uncertainty, uh, 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 the effects will be very temporary because it's like their system needs the pain, and um, you know if it if, you know you need to check that anyway. Just because because if there's something wrong with you and they haven't figured mm. it out, you you know your system's not going to let go of that pain no matter how you try. Uh, absolutely, that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, there might be a, a reason for the pain. Check that out first. That's yeah. right, and and um, uh, that's what I have found that. And so, so the if it's not if it's not changing, 
you know you want to be you know want to be showing what's going on here you know what, what's what's uh what's your what's your medical situation what's your diagnosis what's your how how much how, you know how confident are you that the doctors have have got got it all worked out mm -hmm. and sometimes it's just having a conversation about that they don't you know, no one's ever really just given that person a chance to say uh, you know i'm i'm worried that the doctor hasn't really you know fully understand my condition or isn't treating it completely and and um they do, you know they just need to to talk that through and, and be honest about yeah. that. yeah right yeah good point so um that's that's the, i mean that's emdr in a nutshell and w the, the reason i brought in hypnosis was because i found that for clients with chron with um, kind of complex trauma histories that um just just you know emdr really relies on you having kind of reasonable level of energy and a sort of intact nervous system and, and a lot of my clients are just exhausted they've got nothing in the tank they're really um, you know years and years of ill health and trauma and medical you know treatment and and maybe on all sorts of uh, drugs and things they're really um they really uh, haven't got much to draw on so for them i've brought i really feel hypnosis is um, more helpful because in hypnosis is really about feeding the client, you know, suggestions, possibilities, stimulating relaxation and safety. And, you know, it's more collaborative, perhaps, whereas EMDR really, it really, it's really about the client, you know, they've got to really produce the result. So um, I want to talk a little bit about hypnosis. And the first thing I want to do is I want to disabuse everyone of the notion that hypnosis is something that the therapist does to the client hypnosis is something that happens between the patient and the therapist it's a it's a product of the therapeutic relationship it's an interaction um and so um and i can't i can't hypnotize anyone or make anyone enter into trance if we don't have a safe trusting relationship I, yes, I, you know, I, I, they're not going to respond to my suggestions if they don't trust me and feel safe with me. So that's the that's the first thing about hypnosis. The okay. second thing to say is that it's something that about ninety percent of us have the capacity to do. We we all in our everyday life enter states of trance, absorption, highway hypnosis, whatever you want to call it, where we're you know where we're just checked out, where we're not present. To what's going on around us and we all need to do that uh, it's, it's just um, part of um, what they call uh, ultradian rhythm so at night time we have this you know we have the circadian rhythm of night and day where we re we rest and we go through these cycles in our sleep where we're resting for about 80 or 90 minutes and we're kind of we're going through REM sleep where we're active for about 20 minutes processing information in the daytime that cycle is reversed and we're active for about every 80 or 90 minutes and then we go into a kind of a, a cycle of rest and and re-energizing every you know every 90 minutes or so so you'll all notice this in your daily routine and that is that is really the optimum time to utilize trance when a person's you know in that kind of downward uh, uh cycle and um you know going into a kind of kind of going to kind of going inwards into a more relaxed state in their mind and their body and you so you can utilize um those our uh, tradian rhythms to make the best of of hypnosis Um, the other the other kind of way of understanding hypnosis is to think of it in terms of association and disassociation as a kind of attentional pruning process. So can everyone see the dog? If you look at that if you look at that picture long enough and you look at it in, as a gestalt, you'll, a picture of a dog will emerge. And the, the, the point is, that we pay attention to things and and sometimes in narrow ways and sometimes in more open ways and that and that right now you're you're paying attention to the things that i'm saying or maybe that picture and so as you do that you are by default not paying attention to other things and i cannot you, see a dog <laughs> you can't see the dog yet mark mark okay. do you see a dog yeah oh mark mark Oh, other people are seeing. Yeah, I can see the dog. dog. Clearly, it's right. a Dalma, it's a Dalmatian. What? 
Yeah, it's like I need to uh, widen my scope. The the head of the dog is right in the middle of the screen, and the body is off to the right. Okay, I'll be yeah. working on it. Yeah, it's okay, don't and that, and in fact, you see, but the more you try to see the dog, yeah, actually, yeah. the less you'll see it. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the more you just relax and see the whole picture. But the, the point I'm making is that hypnosis is about paying attention to one thing at the expense of another. So if you're in pain and then you have a nice little daydream about lying in a hot pool of water and, you know, feeling the water, you know, you know, loosening your muscles and making your body feel more relaxed and maybe remembering that time that you had that South Sea holiday or you were at a, you know, in a friend's spa pool uh, um, you know, you 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 can you can kind of go back to that experience and relive that experience and become absorbed in the memory of that experience and forget about your you know your present reality. And as I'm and as I'm talking to you all now about hot water and memories of being floating in water, probably quite a few of you are actually recalling experiences like that. And you've you've just left the room for the moment and gone back to that experience and. That's really, in a way, that's what hypnosis is. It's just about choosing to pay attention to one thing at the expense of another. And why not pay attention to something that stimulates feelings of comfort and relief instead of that discomfort and, uh, you know, unpleasantness. And, you know, you know, that unpleasantness can be there, but, you know, you don't need to pay any more attention to it than is really necessary so much easier just to let your mind drift off to someplace else that's more comfortable and uh, you know um, where you can feel differently is everyone still with me mm -hmm. i think they've all gone off to a, a, a nice warm <laughs> yeah um my question about that uh so it and it's not just i mean it is get, taking a break it is changing your focus but the more, would you say the more often you do that, you actually can, like, are you shifting neural pathways? Or is it more um, of just a, a break? I don't know. I don't know what the research says about that. But I, I think that anything, anything that you do regularly, you mm. know, you're going to develop new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, you're going to retrain your brain. The, the thing I'd say, especially about hypnosis or meditation, really, or any of those things is, is the more you try, the less it's going to work. It's 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 really about just creating the space and the conditions, and you know, doing your meditation or listening to the hypnosis recording, whatever it is, and just in adopting an attitude of let whatever happens happens. The minute you know you start trying to see that dog, you're not going to see that dog. You know, it's it's got to just sort of come. Have you seen yeah. it yet? No, oh, I'm embarrassed to say that I I still. Oh, don't. Madeline. I yeah. need to, maybe I'm not, I'm looking too hard. But, but you are, you are, it's okay. It'll, she it'll, can see the bigger, she can see the bigger picture. You'll hate, you'll hate me when you see it. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so that's, so that's just, that's, that's, yeah, yes, I believe, I, I believe it will change, you know, it does lead to um, change neural pathways, definitely. Uh, I've got clients, you know, chapter and verse, who, who are proof in the pudding of that, who, who, um, some have no some have no pain now some have pain but it's a way lot less than it was when they started seeing me and it just isn't it is just isn't center stage in their life anymore right there are two now there are two main applications of hypnosis to trauma and pain um let me think about that um one is that you can use hypnosis as a way of uh, accessing traumatic memories and processing them rather like EMDR but it's sort of kind of more helpful for people who can't remember um, you know their, their childhood trauma the other way that you can you know, can use hypnosis and that I use a lot with my more complex clients is I use kind of kind of I've got a series of scripts that I've created about 20 or a dozen or so um, which are quite elaborate and take people on a real journey. Yeah. And I've got different scripts. For, I've got scripts for neuropathic pain, for example, which teach people, which really, really have a lot of suggestions about stimulating Schwann cells and fibroblasts, which are, uh, are associated with cell healing and regeneration. I've got scripts for teaching people how to sleep normally and get a restful sleep by retraining their brain to go through the different phases of the sleep cycle. 
So most chronic pain sufferers have got are having trouble getting restful sleep. They have very broken and non-restorative sleep because their sleep cycle is completely out of whack. And um, the, 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 I've created a, a sort of brain retraining program which helps them their brain relearn how to have a normal you know, sleep cycle phase with the REM and the non-REM sleep and the rest and the regeneration and all that sort of thing. And um, so that's a, that's another another script that, you know, isn't done sort of spontaneously, but is, but is recorded. And um, um, it's something that the client then can re-listen, can listen to before they're going to sleep at night and kind of program their brain to go into a good night's sleep. And then there is all the things like, you know, all the imagery like hot and cold and water and pain dials and, um, and you, know, specific, you know, sort of sort of guided suggestions for actually helping manage the pain. And now are those uh, available from your website? Yes, they're, they're, you sure. can buy the script bundle. They're $20 on the website. Um, and, overcoming pain. Dot, dot, uh, overcoming yeah. pain. Overcomingpain.com. Pain.com. Um, and a lot of them, yeah. a lot of a lot of them are already on my Overcoming Pain app. Oh, right. That, there's the app as well that people yeah. can use. Yeah. yeah. So over, that's also called Overcoming Pain. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the other yeah. thing I want to just mention is that the webinar that you did with us um, a, a year or so ago, if for people that didn't get to see it, is still up on our website. And there were also five, I think they were three or five exercises that Mark took us through um, on that webinar that people also found helpful. Thanks for, thanks for reminding. I know we're on time, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I think we're at about, yeah. we're, yeah, just if you had any, I did see some questions come up around that exactly around um, treatment and how they can um, access, uh, um emdr it is i think it is helpful to have an emdr therapist or intervention or hypnosis that is geared towards pain do you yes no definitely definitely um, um it's it's just a little bit it's quite different to working with simply with trauma mm -hmm. and you um it, it, there's a, it's got a much more somatic focus uh, there often are health problems and you know you've got to weave sort of weave the way a little bit between well how much is organic and how much is kind of psychological stress kind of thing and um i think i you know you're a lot of your standard trauma therapists just aren't quite up to that but a good you know um really a good therapist um some of the trauma therapists are up could would be able to work it through, but but not a lot, fortunately. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm doing more trainings. I'm trying to I get think the, the word out there. Yeah, definitely yeah. needed. Yeah. Um, I really I really encourage people. To, I really I'm really a fan of hypnosis for people with chronic and tractable pain. I think it's essential. I don't, and I think um, it it just has so many has so many advantages. Um, there are a lot of people, no matter how much EMDR you do, they're going to have, they're going to have to live with a certain amount of pain and discomfort. And hypnosis is just, just a wonderful tool. And there's a lot of research supporting it uh, for, you know, for managing the pain and um, and the and the stress and the insomnia and all the all the lot of thing, things that go with it. And it's so gentle, there are no side effects, no risks, mm -hmm. really. Um, and it's something anyone can learn to do. Pretty well, I'd say nine to, at least nine out of ten people can learn to do. Well, there you so that's go. Just, yeah. That's just yeah. that's the that's the training my training. But, um, yeah. Well, last, I, any last yeah, and this guy also trains in he does he trains in hypnosis and uh, for therapists anyway and for treatment of pain. He does a good. He's a good. He's good. Oh, and is he in uh, Australia or? No, he's in he's in uh, Florida. In Florida, okay, okay. It, it's so wonderful to have access to, you know, to so many people all over the world now. Um, yes. So I, I just, I really hear this, and I, um, you, you know, if if uh, people have a chance to go onto your website and maybe access 
some of our, or at least to the last webinar that we did and start using some of those exercises um, and perhaps uh, investigate the, um, the hypnosis uh, for pain as well, that it is, it, it sounds like you say, it's, it can be a, it's essential. Yeah, and there's um, even some stuff on YouTube that's free, you know, okay. some quite good stuff. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and I, I just like that people can get on and start, just start, uh, just start trying it out. Just start practicing uh, mm. on your own and see if it actually does, uh, you know, if it gives you a bit of a break from your pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Let me just see if there's, I think there's any other questions. Just, um, yeah, this webinar is recorded and it will be up on the website uh, by tomorrow. So if you want to go back and have a look at it again. And um, yeah, Mark, did, Mark Lawrence, did you have any other questions? No, I think that was a lot, a lot packed into an hour. Uh -huh. Thanks, Mark. That was really, um, it was quite amazing. Um, you know, at least it gives a lot of our patients some somewhere to start, somewhere to think about, you know, um, places where they can start accessing some care, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think we have to think out of the box with, with chronic pain um, again. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think what you were talking about with, with the trauma is sometimes turning down the volume as opposed to, you know, somebody asks, will this ever go away? Well, maybe it never completely goes away, but you 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 deal and you manage it better over time. It it impacts your 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 life less, perhaps, you know. Mm -hmm. and it's often the way I look at you know managing chronic pain with my patients. I say, you know, it's it's about turning the volume down, maybe not off. Mm. So I don't know if you, exactly. Yeah. So thanks very much. That's been a, a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm. Really, really worthwhile. And oh, I'll just yeah. add to, absolutely. And I, I love the explanations as well. Like you, totally. you said, um, mm -hmm. um, and if you are looking for a therapist to see some questions, uh, you can, you know, go just Google and see if there is someone in your area. Uh, but it's really going to be your, you know, if someone that you resonate with, um, mm, that's it, that's it, the most yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it really it really is isn't it yeah and um and if like always don't be afraid to reach out to me if you uh are looking for more resources um and because i'm always looking and i'm always collecting them too so don't be afraid mm -hmm. to reach out yeah yeah all right thanks well Mark. thanks everyone for coming tonight and uh thanks again to dr mark grant who's now going to I'm sure go and enjoy the lovely sunshine of Australia. It looks like it's coming through the window. You can share a little bit with us. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank All right. You. Okay. Good Thanks. night, everyone. Bye. Good night. See you again. Good night, Bye bye. Bye bye. Good to see bye -bye. you again. Bye bye. You too. Bye, Madeline. Bye. Bye. And